In Canada, our culture of human rights begins with people, expressing values that matter to them, like the right to vote, to speak freely, to gather in public without fear, the right to equality, justice, and safety. For many Canadians, human rights are part of everyday life. But behind those rights, there are stories of the clash of ideals, of struggle and debate, of hope and inspiration, and of people working for change. Many of our ideas today about human rights can be traced to the 60s and 70s. At the time, Canada is swept up in a wave of social movements and political change, of voices calling for equality, justice, and dignity. Intense debates spring up among people, groups, and governments about how to create a respectful and inclusive society. In Quebec, the demands for change are even more urgent. People want a modern government without church interference. Francophones within the province want more recognition for their language and culture and better economic opportunities. Some call it the quiet revolution, but it's anything but quiet. These turbulent times raise challenging issues about human rights. What happens when different rights conflict? But the questions, stories, and struggles for rights in Canada go back much further in time. In the early 1800s, there's widespread frustration in the two largest colonies of British North America, Lower Canada and Upper Canada. Many colonists are unhappy with governments that are not accountable to the people. The tensions erupt into a series of rebellions led by radical protesters. Lives are risked and some lost for democratic rights. The rebels lose their battles, but in the years ahead, some of their goals are achieved as democratic reforms and responsible government take hold in the colonies. Political leaders gather first in Charlottetown, then in Quebec City, to discuss ways to join together. In 1867, the Dominion of Canada is formed. Their hope is this new union will improve the way they are governed, build a better economy, and keep citizens safe. For French speakers, it's a way to protect their language and religion. How the government meets those expectations will be a never-ending subject for debate. As the nation expands west to the Pacific coast and north to the Arctic Ocean, it seeks more space for settlement. The government negotiates with indigenous peoples who already inhabit the land. Colonial officials and indigenous leaders sign these treaties based on the spirit and intent to share land between nations. But that intent is not fulfilled. Instead, indigenous traditional ways of life are disrupted for generations to come. After assuming claims to the land, the government launches a campaign to attract immigrants from Europe. Thousands respond, hoping to find work, to own property, and create better lives for their families. Many are fleeing persecution to find religious and political freedoms in Canada. Some newcomers find what they were promised in the government's brochures. They prosper in Canada's growing cities. But others work long hours for low wages. They live in overcrowded housing and cope with hunger, poverty, and disease. Thousands of workers struggle to improve their conditions by joining the growing labor movement. They stage protest strikes across the country, demanding fair wages, safer workplaces, and union recognition.
many people are asserting their rights for the first time. But the year 1929 brings new hardships as stock markets tumble and economies collapse around the world. In the grip of the Great Depression, millions of Canadians are unemployed and desperate. Workers and farmers, men and women, appeal for the government's help in providing employment and social security, programs to keep body and soul together. The federal government eventually responds with relief projects and welfare assistance. After years of struggling to survive, people view their government in a new way. They now see it as responsible for protecting their right to an adequate standard of living. As the Depression comes to an end, an even greater challenge to rights and freedoms lies ahead. In the late 1930s and 40s, the Second World War unfolds across the globe, and people's rights are not just unprotected, they're obliterated. Canadians join the Allied fight for freedom abroad. At home in Canada, the crisis of war provokes a different reaction. Civil liberties are suspended because of perceived threats to security. Canadians seen as dangerous are interned in camps, deported, or arrested and detained without fair trial. These rights violations compel many people to act. They form rights associations, mount campaigns, and bring court challenges, defending freedom of religion, association, and expression. At the same time, several provinces pass laws against discrimination. I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right. In 1960, the Canadian Bill of Rights is enacted. This national law reflects the federal government's commitment to join Canadians in the cause of human rights. The bill is an important step, but it's limited in how it can be applied. More and more people choose direct action to promote equality and justice. They're inspired by the struggles of the past and the challenges around them. Through it all, the language of human rights is fast becoming a vehicle for social change. And it's not long before the conversation really starts to heat up. In Quebec, a growing desire for independence provokes a small group of extremists to radical action. As it did before in wartime, the federal government uses the War Measures Act to suspend civil liberties. People are questioned, arrested, and detained. Homes are raided and searched by police. These events divide Canadians, forcing them to ask fundamental questions about freedom. Does national security justify the denial of human rights? This time of fear and crisis shows just how fragile those rights really are. After decades of working for liberty, justice, and equality, Canadians want their ideals to be fully protected in law. Provinces and territories are on side with the people, developing human rights codes and commissions. In 1975, Quebec adopts a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Its protections for social, economic, and cultural rights are unique in Canada. And as the 70s draw to a close, the federal government begins trying to enact a national Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The plan is to include it in Canada's constitution, the nation's supreme law. Debate sparks across the country. What rights and whose rights should be included in a national charter? People mobilize for action. Women, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, 
people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. All want the Constitution and its charter to affirm the rights they have fought for all these years. Many are successful, but other issues have yet to be resolved. In 1982, Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms officially becomes part of the Constitution. It sets out the values of Canadians. What's clear is that Canadians have taken many journeys in the effort to create a fair and just society. But the work of creating that society isn't finished. Attempts have been made to redress past wrongs. New challenges and opportunities lie ahead. And our conversation about human rights is expanding. Through dialogue and passion, struggle and action, the stories of human rights in Canada continue to unfold. <laughs>